Giaguit, hello. Welcome to the podcast series of the Center for Irish Studies at Villanova University. My name is Joseph Lennon, Emily C. Riley, Director of the Center. And I'm Jennifer Joyce, Associate Director and Curator of this series. We appreciate the support from our many donors, especially a generous grant from the Connolly Foundation. This podcast series brings to listeners a rich variety of Irish studies topics. Our Villanova Center for Irish Studies spans nine academic disciplines, and here our faculty and students talk with distinguished thinkers, artists, writers, academics, political leaders, and other campus visitors. We really appreciate our ongoing community support. Thank you so much for listening. If you are looking to attend a live Irish Studies event, please join us on Villanova's campus during the academic year for our free event series. You can follow us on social media, find us at our website where you can sign up for our newsletter, or you can always email us at irishstudies at villanova.edu. We're fortunate to have three acclaimed Irish poets reading collaboratively here with us on this podcast, Catherine Phil McCarthy, Katie Donovan, and Jane Clark. Um, we're going to be talking about sustainability and poetry. I wanted to preface with a few remarks and give um, some biographies of the, th of the three poets. These poets explore um, the, how poetry matters, um, how it can, I think I'm quoting from you, Catherine, uh, reveal and restore the past, giving memory and story legitimacy. We've been talking about culture's role in spreading an ethos of sustainability and living in harmony with the planet and talking about our parents' and grandparents' generations. The work of the poet, perhaps, is to see clearly, to remember without avoiding pain, and to imagine futures beyond the trials of the present. We have many solutions to climate change, but one of the greatest challenges lies within ourselves and our will to prioritize climate action and climate care. Catherine, you were reminding me of the poet Michael Longley's assertion that, quote, a poet must look after words and he must not use them as, mere to, as a mere tool, but rather makes with them. So everyone, please tune in and, and listen carefully um, as we hear some poems from these three wonderful visitors from Ireland. I'm very fortunate to have just had some tea with. Uh, Jane Clark has published three poetry collections with Blood Axe Books, The River, when the Tree Falls and A Change in the Air, as well as an illustrated chapbook, All the Way Home. Jane received the Ireland Chair of Poetry Travel Award in 2022 and the Hennessy Literary Award for Poetry in 2016 and the Listowel Writers Week Poem of the Year in 2016. A Change of the Air is shortlisted for the Forward Prize in Poetry 2023. She grew up on a farm in the west of Ireland and now lives with her wife in the uplands of County Wicklow. Katie Donovan has published five collections of poetry, all with Blood Axe books. Her most recent, Off Duty, was shortlisted for the Irish Times Poetry Now Prize. In 2017, she received the Lawrence O'Shaughnessy Award for Poetry. Her work has appeared in the best-selling anthology Staying Alive, Real Poems for Unreal Times, and the Wake Forest Book of Irish Women Poets, edited by Peggy O'Brien. She edited Ireland's Women's Ireland's Women, sorry. Ireland's Women Writings Past and Present with Brendan Kennelly and Norman Jeffries. She grew up on a farm in County Wexford and now lives in Dalkey, a suburb of Dublin. Catherine Phil McCarthy has published five collections of poetry, including Daughters of the House the Invisible Thre and the Invisible Threshold, shortlisted for the Irish Times Poetry Now Prize, both with Daedalus Press Dublin. She is a former editor of Poetry Ireland Review and she received the Lawrence O'Shaughnessy Award for Irish Poetry in 2014. She was poet in residence at, I'm going to not give a good French accent, the Centre Cultural Irlandais uh, in spring of 2013. She was awarded a month-long residency at Verona, at Veruna, Veruna. At Veruna, the National Writers' House, NSW Australia, in October of 2022 for work on her forthcoming collection, Catching Sight, a native of County Limerick. She also lives in Dublin. So welcome, all three of you. Thanks for being here um, at Villanova's campus. We're going to have a wonderful reading tonight. And could you give me a preview of, of a poem, perhaps each of you? Maybe we go in the order in that I introduced okay. you. Jane I'd first. be delighted to, and thanks very much for inviting us here. Um, I'm going to read a poem from my third collection, A Change in the Air, and the poem is At Perching Harbour. Basking sharks, 
docile as seal pups, harpooned and netted from currucks, were towed one by one to the fishery at the slipway. Fathers and sons sliced off dorsal fins and hacked through blubber to reach oil-filled livers. Sweating in burnhouse heat, they shoveled bleeding flesh into the rendering machine. They couldn't wash the smell from their skin, not if they swam to Inish Galvan at the end of every shift. Year by year, the catch diminished, disappeared. But late last April, old men cheered from the headland and said, it's as if we've been forgiven. A school of 12 cruised into Keem Bay, moon tail swishing, fins proud as yawl sails above the waves. Thank you, Katie. Would you read a poem, please? Thank you. Happy to. This poem, we were just talking actually about laundry and washing and drying and uh, proudly saying, no, I don't have a dryer. I use the line. Um, so this poem, um, it's called What My Hands Touch. And I noticed when I began to uh, stay at home a little bit more because I had a new baby that there was a lot of washing um, that had to be done um, every day. And then I began to think about women who couldn't turn on the tap, what that was like to have to walk miles to find water that's often dirty or contaminated and to carry it home again. And then I thought, well, what would happen if all the women of the world had a tap? So the little twist at the end. What my hands touch. Every day, drool, excrement, nose snorts, spurts of sick, the vast gushing of water needed to clean up, wondering how the women cope who have no tap. Every day, baby skin, cat fur, stale bedding, rumpled hair, the vast gushing of water needed to clean up, wondering how the women cope who have no tap. Every day, my own brittling skin veiny legs, nails that grow too long, the vast gushing of water needed to clean up, wondering how the women cope who have no tap. Every day, crinkle of old leaves, clouts of earth, errant roots and weeds, the vast gushing of water needed to clean up, wondering how the women cope who have no tap. Every day, greasy plates and bowls, tacky floors and toilet smells, the vast gushing of water needed to clean up. Wondering how the women cope who have no tap. Wondering how the world would turn if all those women could turn the water on just as easily as I do. Only the desert would be left. A clean, lifeless vista of endless grains of polished sand. Thank you. Catherine Phil? Native Trees is published in Divining Dante that was edited by Nessa O'Mahony and Paul Munden. And they invited 72 poets across the world to respond to the Divine Comedy. Mm. And I was reading the Divine Comedy during the lockdown. So this poem really came partly from that kind of parallel project. I watched a documentary in the summer of 2020 on the fires in New South Wales oh. and the devastation. And the following year, a friend showed me a WhatsApp photo that her niece sent from the Blue Mountains and to do with recovery. And I was really struck by that, how the earth had already begun to recover mm. in the space of six or eight months. Native trees. Yesterday, she sent the mountainside, all pink flannel flowers and shrubby greens, flowing for miles to the valley, far as the eye can see. 
the understory of woodland taken root after wildfires of last summer reached a pine at the bottom of the garden, crackled along the fence through undergrowth and threatened the house. Down the road, the community fled stifling heat. Blinded with smoke, they struggled to breathe, returned to charred stumps of trees, the hinterland, a smouldering desert, a blackened ruin of foul embers and bitter tears. Here, plants not seen for years germinate from seed and pollen after nestling a lifetime in the forest, break dormancy in warm sunlight, sprout ferny leaves and blooms, soften the wounded earth with myrtle and gum saplings, counter human failings and greed with a wilderness of native trees. Have us dream of the paradise given, our abundant heaven. I remember those fires. They were so devastating that you didn't think that, I mean, it, it was, with all of the change that's happening in the world, it seemed emblematic. And this was during the pandemic. Early on in the yeah. lockdown, right. February of 2020, yeah. March of 2020. Yeah. And I think what was really unusual in Australia, um, Tim Flanagan, who, who's head of the, he's a government advisor on climate. Mm. And he talked about the fact that in, in the normal case of events, 2% of the forest may burn, you know, and even in control burning situations. But in this case, we're talking about 20%. Hmm. I mean, the scale of it was really very And the animal shocking. destruction as well. And the, the animal destruction and the sense of loss. So, yeah. And um, insect, I mean, the entire. Yes. Birds. I mean, this is sort of, I mean, I remember that and thinking the earth is burning. We are in, I mean, we're in serious danger in, in a sense right now on the planet. And often our solutions are technical or, or around policy. And I'm so happy to hear and to read poems that are wrestling and thinking and expressing climate anxiety, a sense of hope. What's, what is your sense, and maybe we can just take turns, but what is your sense of poetry's role if we have to give it a role um, but how do we, how does poetry enter the discussion around sustainability? Well, one of the things I am struck by, I've just edited... Uh, and this is Jane, sorry. Jane, sorry. Wanna, yeah. yeah, I just edited an anthology of Irish nature poetry. Mm. And it's from Yeats on, so it's recent, yeah. relatively recent. Yeah. Yeah. But when you look at Irish poets, nearly all of them write nature poetry. Yeah. So whether they see themselves as nature poets or not, many that don't, but I find nature poetry in so many of their work, wonderful nature poetry. But I think that speaks to our dependence on nature to help us express ourselves, mm. to express our deepest emotions and our most, our, our, you know, we need it. It, it. it helps us live our lives. That's one level mm. of, and so I think it's inevitable that poetry is going to respond deeply and is responding deeply to what's happening to our environment. And what I've been, you know, sometimes I feel, you know, well, look, what can a poet do? You know, what can we do? Is there any worth? Would I be better being an activist, for example? Yeah. Spending all those hours I spend editing a poem, right. I could be, you know, with Friends of the Earth in Ireland campaigning. Would that mm. be better use of my time? And yet, you know, the activists tell me, the um, ecologists tell me that they need the arts, artists to speak. Because w one of the things, you know, I know ecologists working in, in um, Wicklow restoring bogs. Mm. And, you know, what one of, the, one of them has said to me, we need our spirits lifted. So I wrote a poem about, you know, restoring bogs. His children know the poem off by heart. Mm. Their daddy goes up to the bog, you know, walks 40 minutes a day to get up there, does his work and comes back down. And he comes down so disheartened. 
So that's on one level. They, they need our support. They need to know that we care what we're doing. These people who are working on the front line, really, really difficult work. The scientists need to know that, that we care what, we're, what they're doing. But then I think the other bit that they're, the scientists are saying, like Bill McKibben, you know, the yeah. brilliant U.S. environmental yeah. writer, like he says the artists are needed equally as the scientists now. Mm. He, he's called on them. And then Rachel Carson's book, sure. she, I mean, the yeah, title came right. from Keats, yeah. La Belle Dame Sans Merci, you know. Yeah. So to, to change people's hearts and minds, we need the arts. Of course, the problem is then if it becomes a lecturing and, right. you know, pedantic Then it's work. back to the professors. Yeah, ex <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking yeah. as a professor. Yeah, it's, well, exactly. But, you know, po poems no, that lecture right. won't work. No. They're yeah. not going to touch we were, people. We were having a conversation the other day um, about advocacy. So I, I wonder where there's advocacy and lecturing and didacticism. What does that, can that kill a poem? I mean, but you, tap, I mean, I call it tap, but what, yeah, what, my, hands it touch, tap, yeah. what my hands touch, yeah. um, it's a beautiful poem, and it's, it's, you can tell that it's not there to harangue people. It's no, there. because it's a conundrum. Yeah. I mean, I'd love all the women so in the world Katie, to have, to have the, to, yes, Katie, yeah. to, have, to be able to turn on their tap. But then, yeah. where would all yeah. our water go? Yeah. So it is a conundrum, and I think it's important not to lose that impetus that all poets have is to go to where those uncomfortable margins mm. are and not have a simplistic slogan. Mm. As Jane was saying, that's that way lecturing lies. Right. Um, whereas uh, poetry is more nuanced, more subtle, um, and has layers. It, th there's, there's often something in a poem that maybe slightly contradicts itself and then mm. leaves the reader with something to ponder. Yeah. So I think in my case, I always loved nature. I grew up on a farm and I loved um, just tramping around the fields and looking at the sheep and their lambs. And then when my children were born, um, I had children quite late. And then that, that love and sense of connection was reborn in their mm. delight mm. in such simple things. Just my daughter looking at shells and pebbles and snails and, and her delight in that. And then my sense of sort of outrage that mm. these younger people are being born into a very different environment, that so many things are being lost and they won't have what we had, that certainty of so many different animals, so many different plants, that plenitude yeah. um, that, we, that our generation has deprived them of. Mm. And I'm always fueled by outrage. Mm. So, um, so it's there. It's it there. It can burn brightly. Yes, yes. The, um, I'm, I'm taken. Um, with, with what you're saying about the, the change in generations. I also had children later in life, and um, their sense of how they perceive the world is very different, and the abundance, perhaps, that I grew up with, um, the sense of that things can go on and on. They don't, at least my sons don't have that, that same sense. Um, is there something about poetry that, and the arts that I don't want to say give us a false sense of hope, but give us a sense of a future that is different than the past. Well, I suppose a sense that you can have a voice, you mm. can you can say something. Mm. And uh, certainly in my new poems, I have a new book coming out next year as well, um, I've written a lot about just the simple rituals of, for example, drying clothes on the line right. and the smell of the lovely fresh clothes or of, of having a garden that you don't have to have neat as a pin and covered yeah. with pesticides, right. um, of having a bird feeder and the joy of seeing the birds or the squ squirrels coming to steal the nuts that are supposedly for the birds. And that may seem simple, but if a lot of people thought, well, I could have a garden like that, this may yeah. be a little bit untidy, yeah. but that, you know, if you go into a corner and you don't use your strimmer, you might find a hedgehog there. Yeah. Um, you know, if they just stopped using pesticides and chemicals in their gardens, it would just be a small thing, sure. but it's something. And cultural change, I mean, happens through culture. Um, I know, I'm trying, right now my garden is, I'm letting it, I'm letting it go gradually, gradually. And I, I, I'm writing a poem in my head when I'm out mowing my lawn and I'm looking at all the clover and all the strawberries. And the last line of the poem, I don't have the poem figured out, but the last line is, let my defeat come in strawberries and clover. Oh, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful, yes. Anyway, but Catherine, um, 
can we talk, can we come back a little bit to, to advocacy and the idea of, because yes. we've, we've spoken about this before and that idea of that can poetry, um, how can it change people? Or can we write something where we're trying to direct change? It doesn't seem to work that easily. I think that what's, what's different in this case is what is at stake mm. for humanity. Mm. And I'm thinking of the word ecology and eco that comes from the Greek oikis. Mm. And the word oikis, echo, is, is the word for home in Greek. Oh. And so here we have, you know, we've, we've seen so many people, even in the last year, and uh, whose homes have been threatened. So uh, we, we're, I think that there's a sense when you kind of, it, it's impossible to ignore it yeah. at the moment. So there, there is that profound sense of threat. And I think the other thing is that um, once you start taking action, things change. And, and as Katie has just mentioned, uh, even in small ways, because somehow there, there is a sense of hope growing from it. But I think it's going to take everybody in the planet to actually, uh, you know, and th there are major things that need to happen. I think consumerism is a huge problem. Yeah. A world that is driven by a consumerist economy is an enormous problem. And I think that that raises major question marks. But I think there are also big issues in relation to things like land care, in relation to, you know, traffic. Um, how do you, you know, uh, I think something like 27 percent of carbon emissions in the small country that I come from, Ireland, um, road traffic, yeah. you know, petrol. It's a major source in the United States. It, it's a major source. Um, and the change is already happening in mm. Ireland. One in three people are buying, or, you know, their electric cars. It's it's not a perfect solution. There's a problem with infrastructure. Sure. There's lithium needed. So, um, but to come back to the question of poetry, somehow, all our lives, um, poetry comes from um, the deep layer, really, and from experience and I think all of us are experiencing are having experiences where we can we can e either relate um, you know I, I, I can write a poem about the famine where you see somebody with all of their goods heaped on carts mm. and you can sort of think okay this is happening a couple of a thousand miles away from sure. me today it's yeah. happening to a lot of people yeah. so it, my way of writing about it may be to find a distance, to go mm. to the famine, to go mm. to a time when Ireland was really having struggles mm. with certain issues. Yeah, history comes into your work. I mean, a lot. I love it in Daughters of the House, how it threads through. Yes, and I think war. I mean, I, th I think yeah. when we think about the, you know, we, I, I read a poem just now to do with fire, but when you think about the damage that fire has caused in the last over the last year, mm. um, it's, it's like one of the big countries producing carbon emissions. You know, mm. I think it's the fourth in the world, fourth or fifth that, uh, now that, that fires. Yeah. So, so it, it's the, the need for action is urgent. Mm. And I think poetry is a live medium. I think people are very alert to it. And um, and I think the response is growing, and I think young people are yeah. are wide awake to it as well. I I want to come back to to something that Jane said, and I'm just thinking about um, in at Pertine Harbor the I mean the basking sharks killing basking sharks is I remember the Man of Aaron right in that film where they're killing the basking shark, but that line it's as if we've been forgiven. Um, I wanted to ask you about that that there's when, we ha when we're writing about the past and we're writing about the present, as Catherine was just saying, as, I mean, sort of the, the past as a, a vehicle to understanding our present, what, where were you going with that line with, it's as if we've been forgiven? 
Well, actually, the line was given to me mm. by a, a fisherman who yeah. had been who had worked yeah. in that fishery mm. uh, years ago, and he he was talking about how the basking sharks disappeared off the coast of mm. Ireland because they were fished That's into right, extinction. And then, you know, in recent years, in the last 10 years, they have come back. Yeah. And now, actually, it, it, they're a protected species in yeah. Ireland, which is wonderful. And right. there's something marvellous about that, you know. And that was changed by cultural change. Yeah. You know, that was attitudinal That's change. Right. But he, he said that he said he said something like that, that it was as if yeah. we'd been forgiven. They're, they're enormous and docile is the, the word there. Yes. Amazing yeah. creatures. They're so, and they're so gentle. And, yeah. and all, all they eat is plankton. Yeah. You know, and they're the second biggest fish in the world. And, you know, there was something about their docility and, the, the, and the, what we did to them. Yeah. You know, and and and. I suppose that's part of and the poem that I wanted to have, you know, the shoveled bleeding flesh. I didn't want mm. to move away from the horror of what right. it was. Right. And in, in Ackel, they have the photographs from mm. the fishery are yeah. up on that key. So, you you know, while he was talking to us about it, we were looking at the photographs mm. of this flesh, right. you know. But I suppose, so w forgiven... I suppose I do think that there is something the Christian notion of punishment mm. and forgiveness. I mean, I suppose I was sure. brought up a Christian, I, and so that's part of the way I I see the world. It's you know part of what affects me, even though I'm not Christian now. But I think it was affecting him and others around him. That sense that, and it, it's just like you know you said at the beginning about nature coming back and restoration. That's in your poem there, uh, Phil, and it's it's. That's what you see in all the restoration work. Give nature a chance. It comes back so quickly, mm. incredibly quickly, mm. if it's given a chance. Um, and, and I suppose we were talking about hope earlier, but I've, I've read some ecologists saying it's not hope, it's courage we need. Mm. I find that distinction really helpful mm. because there are some things we can't hope for anymore. We have gone too far. There are some things that will not be dis restored. Yeah. I'm sorry to say, yeah. but that is the truth. But we need courage to face these things. All of us together, we need courage. And, you know, you know again, I've, I've heard activists say that they found that just frightening people with statistics doesn't help because people... It's just, you get a room full of frightened people. You get a room full of frightened people who, who then give up, yeah. who give up and say, well, what does... No, you need to empower people. Yes. And that often comes in very small ways. And mm. I remember in the 90s... Um, and this is Katie again. Yes, a, for, a former boyfriend of mine um, who uh, had this habit of separating out his rubbish. And mm. I was going, why is he doing that? <laughs> and then I thought, well, actually, that's a good idea. You know, it was a totally novel idea at the time. Now, of course, we do it automatically. Mm. Mm. But, I, but that was one person. And although we broke up soon after, and um, that habit remained with me, mm. uh, and so I, I was doing that way ahead of the time when it became just normal mm. policy and the rubbish collection companies facilitated it. Well, so one person can make a difference, yeah. and then another friend of mine who's sadly no longer with us, he had a sustainable phone. Now, a sustainable fund, I suppose, is a relative term, but it was made by a company that was very careful about how it got the ingredients to make the phone, mm. and about who was working in those mines? Were they children? Mm. No, you know, they, they, they were right. against child labor. And I remember thinking, gosh, that's a very unusual idea. And so in his honor, after he died, he died young with cancer, I got myself a Fairphone, which is a phone that's made in Amsterdam. Mm. And it's, it's all about recycling when it's finished or empowering you to fix it yourself. Yeah. Uh, if there's just something small that's wrong with it. It's and it's not fancy, but every time I use it, I think of that friend of mine who inspired me to buy it. So sometimes it's just that. And, you know, and one little poem can be quite powerful too. So if it can, change can come slowly and incrementally, but I think you don't have to be lectured. You need to see someone who's already doing something that you admire and think, oh, sure. yes, I could do that. Sure. One small thing. And you know, you said something else that, that struck me that about separating waste. In, a, in the United States, it's rare for um, communities to separate out compost from, from the recyclables and the trash. And we still have an enormous waste problem here. And most of our, well, 
a good portion of our recycling, I don't know the percentage and it varies by community, is still being sent to incinerators. So we, I, I say this because, as we would say, you all aren't from around here, <laughs> but you're here now. And if you can think about Ireland and Irish America or Ireland and its relationship to the United States, Ireland has a lot of soft power in terms of culture. How many Academy Awards, how many Nobel laureates, how many pop stars come from a very small island? Um, it has an outsized impact in the United States. And I wonder, do you ever think about your relationship to the broader diaspora in terms of cultural production? I don't know. It's a big question. Sorry. <laughs> Catherine? I, 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 think, um, I think we're very aware of it. Yeah. Uh, Ireland is a very, very small country. Irish poetry is a very crowded place. Mm. I think... But it's a wonderful, what a wonderful crowd. I, I think, <laughs> Thank uh, you. Thank you. you know, the standing army of 10,000 that mm. Patrick Havner <laughs> spoke about. Yeah. I think America, I, I think the Irish diaspora, um, you know, we, we're a tiny country, but there is a great kind of people out there mm. who, that we are connected to. And I think it gives the country an enormous sense of confidence. Mm. I mean, you know, Joe Biden's visit was really unbelievable mm. in Dublin. The atmosphere in Dublin for a week was, wow. was really quite something. And um, what, what's, what's interesting to me is that people feel connected to other parts of the world. And I think when we think about the diaspora, what we're very aware of is that we all share this very complicated past and history mm. that the country has had including its mythology. Yeah. Um, and I think what's interesting about Ireland, uh, because it's a small country in Western Europe, it can kind of take a lead. You know, Ireland, some of the months in last year, it produced 70% of its energy from wind. Mm. And that is already with only kind of beginning Remarkable. wind production. Yeah. So that's already happening. So that there is this sense that we, we need to have this back and forth with the people, with people across the world, mm. and with, especially with Irish people mm. uh, who, who feel a sense of connection to the country. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I, I think it's there with music, it's there with poetry, it's there with stories, it's there with dancing, mm. uh, it's there with hurling. It's, you know, so I, I, I feel that that sense of what is a shared past is yeah. so important it, for our future. Sure. Because I mean, I feel, I, as a director of a center for Irish studies, <laughs> I agree. Um, the, I mean, to keep our connections and to understand our histories um, helps us understand the present and helps us, I think, navigate and maybe have courage I like what you said, Jane, about the need for courage, the, the need for hope. Um, and again, some of those small connections. Yeah. Um, I was just um, thinking of a poem that I wrote about the famine, which focused on the tragedy that happened in the Dulock Valley. Um, and I won't go into the whole backstory, but it, it just meant a great deal of loss of life in a very unjust situation yeah. involving greed and, and unfairness. Um, but what happened to those people at that time in 1849 was heard about by the Choctaw Nation in the U.S., who had just right. been through their own trail of tears. Mm -hmm. They sent a donation of over $700, which was a lot of money at that time, to try to help victims mm -hmm. of the famine in Ireland. And, uh, and the upshot of that is in recent times there is a famine walk that replicates that long walk that those people, mm -hmm. many of whom died, had to make in 1849. And once, at one point... The, some members of the Choctaw Nation came over and walked that famine trail. And every year people remember what happened. Yeah. They raise money and they send the money to other countries in the world who are facing we famine. Are, we are very and, much in the same planet here. Yeah, so small connections mm. can, can have a fantastic outreach, and I think particularly in the case of Ireland. Yeah. We're going to um, uh, wrap it up here. And I just wanted to thank everybody for being here. Thank you, Jane Clark. Thank you, Katie Donovan. Um, and thank you, Catherine Phil McCarthy. 
Um, it's a great pleasure to have you. Thank you. Our pleasure, too, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.